All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Andrew Gage. I'm a staff lawyer with West Coast Environmental Law. I am joined uh, by my colleague Barb Everdeen uh, and uh, by Peter Gibbs from Organized BC. We're um, proud to be hosting the first Defend BC webinar, uh, which is the organizer's journey. And before, I'll, I'll say a bit more about uh, West Coast and Defend BC and then turn things over to Peter. But first, I'm just going to run through the technology that we're using for those who aren't familiar with GoToWebinar. Um, you'll see a box on the top right-hand corner of your screen uh, known as uh, the, the, yeah, the, the control panel. You can control the control panel, make it vi visible or not visible by um, clicking on the orange arrow. It'll disappear and you can make it visible by clicking again on it. The um, audio pane contains information about your audio information. Either you can listen to the broadcast through the mic and speakers on your computer, or you can um, and you can you can test that and, and uh, address problems with that uh, using your audio setup. You can also use the telephone if you don't have a, a microphone and want to be able to ask questions later orally. Uh, in which case you'll click on the use telephone button and uh, dial the number you'll see there and enter the PIN number. You can also submit questions uh, by text using the questions pane. Uh, we may at some point in the uh, webinar ask you to raise your hand. Uh, on the, that bar we were looking at earlier, you'll see a raise my hand button. Uh, and you you can do that to indicate that you have something to be to say, or if we um, we ask you to indicate something uh, by raising your hand. There there will be a question answer period at the end of the, the session, and we are recording the session, and everyone will receive an email link to today's recorded session. Session. So with those formalities out of the way. I'd li just like to say a little bit about uh, West Coast Environmental Law and Defend BC. Um, West Coast Environmental Law was, uh, is, I think you're, you're attending this webinar because you've worked with us before or you're aware of us, um, but we are one of Canada's oldest and most successful public interest environmental law organizations. Uh, one of our programs, which I think many of you will also be familiar with, is the Environmental Dispute Resolution Fund, which is a fund that uh, enables community groups and um, others to uh, uh, to hire lawyers to, to provide legal support uh, to, uh, on resolving environmental problems. Uh, but a couple of years ago, we started looking at where we'd been most successful, where, where the grant recipients for that fund had been most successful. And we found that, um, that those groups that really were using the legal tools, the legal opportunities that our fund provided to, to have a conversation within their community, to organize people, to, to um, engage in a broader strategy, were the groups that were most likely to succeed with the grants that we, we were providing. And uh, Defend BC is intended, we're, we're going to be rolling out different aspects of the Defend BC program over the coming year, um, but it's intended as a, uh, a set of resources to, to help enable the, the groups we support through the Environmental Dispute Resolution Fund uh, organize uh, and, and really um, carry out a broader conversation about the environmental law issues that are important to them, uh, even as they're supported by the um, by the fund uh, for the legal work. So um, the webinar, this webinar is one of the first of those resources. Uh, we've also been experimenting with uh, making um, online actions available to EDRF clients. Uh, that, that's what's pictured below. And we're, we're gonna continue to explore how best to support um, EDRF grant recipients in, in doing organizing and, and in reaching out to the broader uh, community. So with that explanation, that's, that's why we think that organizing is important and we asked Peter Gibbs to, uh, to join us. Um, I'd like to thank Peter for agreeing to do that and I'd also like to thank uh, Barb, uh, who I mentioned earlier is on the call, um, uh, for her, all her hard work in organizing this webinar. We're really excited to be offering this type of, of service and without further ado, I'll turn the, uh, uh, the webinar over to Peter. 
Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Barb. Um, and hello, everyone. And Andrew, can you give me this screen presenter power? And then I will start. And can everyone see the slide? Andrew, can you see it? Yep, that's live. Perfect. Awesome. Um, well, thanks everyone so much for, for being here today. Um, and this is, we, we call this the organizer's journey and that um, because this is really about the process of community organizing in a social change campaign. Um, and a little bit more of that title will become clear shortly. Um, this is what we're going to do today. We are going to be doing some, uh, a, a few minutes of sort of introductions to myself and the, our organizing model and the people on this call. We'll talk about um, an introduction to our organizing framework, um, and then we'll really focus on the bulk of the last half of the call on the process of strategizing and designing organizing campaign strategy before we do some closing and questions. Uh, but before we do all that, I wanted to introduce myself, uh, Organize BC, and the model a little bit through a story. And so the, this story starts when I'm, uh, let me just, sorry, that story starts uh, when I'm in kindergartens. So this is me on the right when I'm five. Um, and the, when I was in kindergarten, the boys in my class used to play this game where they would chase the girls and try and kiss them. And the girls didn't like it. And so I would try and chase the boys and try and stop them. And it was the first time I can remember thinking that something was wrong and that I should do something about it. Fast forward 15 years and I'm here uh, just in these woods above the rock over here. And I'm reading a, a book by Dr. Seuss, The Lorax, to a bunch of summer campers at a summer camp on Southern Vancouver Island. Um, and we're teaching them about the environment, and I'm reading them the Lorax, and I'm asking them what they think that story means. And all of the kids who I'm working with know what the story, story's metaphors mean, they understand our environmental problems, and they know what they should do as good people to try and solve those problems. Um, and it was at that moment, uh, it, working with those children that summer, that I realized that the things the kids knew we should be doing, I wasn't doing most of those things. And so I got involved in politics. I decided that I should get involved um, in, in the environmental change world, and I, got, I wound up getting involved in political campaigns. Um, three or four years later, I wound up, that found me working on the referendum campaign to change the voting system. Um, and we're sitting with these people here um, on May 12th, uh, 2009, in a pub in Vic West in Victoria watching the results come in. And this team of this small team, plus a few other people, had been all of the people working on the campaign in the seven ridings in the capital regional district in Victoria. And so we were watching the results come in, and it was a pretty devastating night because we lost with 38% of the vote. Uh, and we had this small group of people had tried as hard as we could, um, but it hadn't it hadn't resulted in the change that we wanted to see. And so I gave up for a few years. I stopped. Uh, um, organizing. I didn't really do much activism. Sometimes I'd go to a rally or sign a petition, but that was about it. Uh, until about um, four years later, in January 2013, I wound up speaking at the Enbridge hearings because of an email I got from Dogwood Initiative. And the, I went to the, to, the, um, to the hotel where they were holding the hearings on the day where I was scheduled, and I sort of sat in the waiting room. I didn't really talk to anyone. And then they called us up to go to the, the table. I helped the 90-year-old woman next to me turn on her microphone, and then I gave my speech. And then when I came back to the waiting area, all these people who hadn't been speaking to me before started coming up and saying they liked what I'd said. Um, a prof of mine from university was there. And I felt like there was all of these people around me who cared about the things that I cared about and that we were making some real difference together. And so I decided that I could, I could try again. But I decided that what I wanted to do was really work that was accomplishing what this photo encompasses, which is there's these ginormous things, these big fish that we want to tackle, um, be they climate change or uh, sexism or capitalism, and that on my own, I'm, that we can't handle that. My little referendum team wasn't big enough to solve the problem that we were trying to fix. 
um, but that together we can get together and, and make change. And so around this time, a lot of NGOs, and especially environmental NGOs in BC, were actually having similar thoughts. They, this was the height of the Harper era of environmental cutbacks and um, sort of slashing environmental regulations. And a lot of them were looking around for examples of progressives winning. And one of the places they wound up looking was south of the border where the Obama campaign had used organizing to great effect uh, to win um, those elections. In 2012, they had 2.2 million volunteers organized on their campaign. And so they started bringing up trainers from some of these, from that campaign connected to this broader framework of organizing. And so there's a few faces on this screen that sort of show the history of where all the things I'm going to talk about come from. And so on the top left, we have a person named Saul Alinsky, who's really considered one of the parents of organizing theory. Um, and he was, uh, in some ways, a mentor of the person on the top right, Cesar Chavez, who I believe his birthday was yesterday. Uh, and Cesar Chavez founded the United Farm Workers Movement in California. And they were this grassroots movement of migrant farm workers who um, won the first labor contract for migrant workers in the United States, which was quite a feat at the time. They wound up doing a you know, continent-wide grape boycott to get grape growers to give contracts to these migrant uh, workers. Um, and then this fell in the middle, Marshall Gans um, was on the United Farm Works campaign. He was the UFW's director of organizing for a number of years. He studied Chavez and the civil rights movement and Dr. Martin Luther King and sort of wrote down in a, on paper in a, in a sort of codified framework how they were organizing their communities um, in a way that you can teach it to people um, and provide them with sort of a, 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 a scaffold of how to think about organizing. Um, and then Marshall Gans was Barack Obama's professor in Harvard um, uh, before Barack Obama became a senator, president, politician, campaigner. Um, and before all that, Obama was actually a community organizer himself. That's a photo of him of being a community organizer in Chicago before he became a politician. And so this is just, just to give some background of where all of the things I'm about to talk about um, came from. And, and so that we didn't invent this organizing framework, and neither did Marshall, that this is really about organize, this is how people have been organizing for years, and this is the last you know, 10 years or so, people have started to write it down and teach it in the way that we teach it. One more caveat before I move on is that all of the faces on this screen are settlers and men, uh, and that there's lots of amazing indigenous uh, organizing and organizing by people of other genders, um, but these people just happen to be the most famous ones for a whole bunch of other reasons. So that's a bit about the organizing framework we're going to use in myself. I work for Organize BC, and we, our mission is to strengthen the skills and connections of progressive organizers across BC through training, coaching, and community building. Our core work is running one to two day core training workshops. Uh, we've run over 30 of them, and we're, we've, we're just probably this year going to reach the 500 mark of the number of people we've trained. This is the first webinar I've ever done. Uh, and so I'm already noticing it's very different. I can't see any of your faces. You are right now 20 names with muted microphones next to you. Uh, and so that's just very different for me. Uh, and so my, I'm going to make an effort to make this as interactive as possible. But just so you know, this is a new format for me. So that's who I am and where this organizing framework came from. But I wanted to do what I could to get to know who you are. And so I'm going to do a poll. And so um, what we're going to do is in your control panel, I am just launching a poll that you will be able to participate in. And so you should be able to use it now. And so you can click on your dashboard on the side. There is a poll option. So go and click on it and say what you've, how long you've been involved in activism or social change, however you want to define it. And then we're just, we have 80% of people who have voted, 85, 90. Oh, it's very exciting. How many more people? Okay, I'm going to close it in five seconds if you haven't voted. Okay, so I'm going to close it and I'm going to share the results with everyone. 
So this is a pretty experienced group of folks. This is probably actually the, the most experienced group of folks I've had in a workshop in a long time. So 53% have been doing this for more than 10 years, uh, 32 for 4 to 10, 11 for 1 to 3, and 5%, which I believe is probably mathematically one person on this call have been doing this for less than a year. Um, what I like to highlight when we see these numbers is that what we really, it's really, I really like having a spectrum of folks. I think the folks who've been involved in this work for a long time, there's a lot of lessons to learn. Um, and the folks who are newer to this often have, can ask questions around like, why are we doing this this way? Um, that can really help force the folks who've been doing it longer to really question um, you know, how, they've been, how they do this work and how they've been doing it. So thank you for doing that. I will now attempt to bring back to my screen. Yes, perfect. Okay, so that's, um, that's how long you folks have been doing it. I also just wanted to throw up um, where everyone is because I thought that was kind of neat. So we have people mostly from BC, but a few people from um, Ontario and Quebec. We have uh, some people from Smithers, Kamloops, Nelson, but a lot of people from the Lower Mainland and Vancouver Island, uh, and then again, a large concentrations of folks on the Sunshine Coast, the Lower Mainland, and Victoria, with a few on the North Island. So, the last thing before we just jump into content is some housekeeping. Um, I might call on you to say something at some point, and so I have the ability to unmute your microphone, um, and get you to talk in. So there's, like, there's two people who I prepped that there's a specific thing I might ask you to talk about, um, but also we're gonna be using the chat, hopefully, to interact with each other. And so if someone says, uh, makes a comment in the chat box that I think is really useful for other people to hear, I might unmute you and ask you to share that. So it's just not me talking. Um, and on that note, I want you to interact in the chat. So um, if you have like a reaction of you're like, oh, that's really neat, or I'm really excited about that, then you can type that in the chat. If you have a, if someone says something in the chat and you want to ask that person a question, you can do that too. If you want to ask me a question, there's a question spot in the uh, in your side panel, um, and it would be really great if you type the question in um, questions for me in there, and then we'll compile them and answer them a couple times through the webinar. So ask questions for me in in the question box and in the chat. Just talk to each other. That would, I think you'll get more. I don't see any questions before, right now before we jump in, so I'm just going to get into our next bit of content. So, introduction to organizing. What we're going to do in this section is we're going to talk about the difference between mobilizing and organizing. We're going to look some, at an example of an organizing campaign. We're going to unpack a definition, and we're going to talk about what we call the five leadership practices, which are the five things we do that, uh, that really could fit together into an organizing framework. So, uh, this is a picture of an uh, event that happened in October of 2012, and it's called. It was called the Defend Our Coast Rally. Um, in Oct I think it was October 22nd, 2012. And I'm just curious if you were there. Could you put your hand up? Um, so hit the hand up button if you were at this event. So I see one, two, three. Okay, so a good handful of folks were actually physically at this event. So here's, here's what happened. And on that day, I was actually uh, in a university class, and one of my profs said, hey, there's this really cool rally going on downtown. It was an environmental studies class, so it was a safe bet that we would all think that that was a true statement. And she said, the notes will be online. You should go to this rally. And so I wound up leaving class and going to this rally. And I got there, and there was, thou there was like over 1,000 people there. There was all these speakers. The, the event went on all day. It was kind of cold, but everyone was wearing raincoats. And there was a lot of really fun and funny signs, uh, and then, then I went home. Okay, so that's the, first, that's the first case study. That was my experience at that event. The next one that I want to share is this one. And so this is on the same campaign, so Defend Our Coast was about um, the Ember Northern Gateway Pipeline primarily and opposing oil tankers on the BC coast. And then about a year and a half later, um, in Kitimat, there was, a, there was a plebiscite, which is a non-binding referendum on the Ember Pipeline itself. So the community of Kitimat, which is the end terminus for the proposed pipeline, had a vote on whether or not they were going to support this project. 
the folks on the right here um, are a group called Douglas Channel Watch. And Douglas Channel Watch uh, is a small grassroots group, grassroots group that was working to turn up the no vote. And so they, what they did was they went knocking on doors. They got, they got a whole bunch of volunteers together and they knocked on half of the doors in Kitimat, talking to voters, um, asking, educating them about the issue, asking them to vote no, and then mobilizing them to vote no on election day. Enbridge also had people on that campaign. They, they flew in canvassers from Calgary who literally drove around in SUVs wearing trench coats and left their uh, cars running in driveways while Douglas Channel Watch walked around in Gore-Tex jackets with backpacks on. Um, and the result was that near 60% of the community uh, voted against the pipeline. Um, and it was a, a, a pretty striking victory. And so these are two examples of uh, campaign action, campaigns or campaign actions on the same issue around Enbridge. And so the question that I want to ask, and I want to ask you to type your answers in the chat box, is how are they different in terms of the experience for the people involved? So compared to, say, someone who was going canvassing to someone attending the rally, or someone organizing the canvassing versus someone organizing the rally. I want you to take a moment and reflect in the chat box how they were different. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is I'm, I'm just going to pause and let you, um, oh, and Andrew's saying to me that he's not 100% sure they have a chat box separate from the questions box. Um, is there a way to find that answer out, Andrew? Maybe I'll just ask. If someone has a chat box, would you please type in it? If you don't, please say so in the questions box. Okay. So this is something I didn't know. I might also just ask, I'm just going to call on Eugene. Eugene, you're unmuted now. Can, do you have a separate chat and question box? And you can talk if you if you if you can hear me, Eugene. Oh, oh you, I, you're too. Hey. <laughs> uh, it just looks like it's the same box, but I and but I you're the see. same box. Okay. That. I, cool. Thank you very much. That's helpful for me to know. So. Um, so can we read some? Yeah, I think what we're gonna have to do then. So we we did a thank you. I'll, I'll mute you now, Eugene. Thank you for that. Um, we did a practice session yesterday, but we were all organizers, so we could all see the chat box. Um, so what I'm going to do is just ask you to put them in the question box then, because I wanted people to be able to share. So, um, so yeah, just type them in there, and then I'll I'll just read the questions as if, um, as if they're like that. So, so. People are, people are typing, that's really helpful. I'll give you one more minute to type your reflections in the question box. So it's not a question, um, but I'm asking you to type your thoughts in that question box anyways. I'm just gonna give you a moment. And now I have this fun moment where I get to just be silent while you all think and type. How they were different. <laughs> I'm going to come, come back to everyone in 30 seconds. Okay, so um, I see a lot of really, really insightful comments. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm going to ask a few people to share um, some of their thoughts. So Sierra, um, you wrote attending versus connecting in the question box, and I'm wondering if you can talk more about that. You're unmuted. Are you able to, to explain more about that? Uh, oh, okay. First, I need to turn on the mic. Yeah, I can hear you. And I was having my lunch. 
sorry, sorry about that. What did you mean by attending versus connecting? Uh, well, you were asking about the rally, so you just showed up. Oh, got too many devices going. So the rally you just showed up. Yeah, where you just show up and it's you kind of participate, and then the group in Kitimat where they canvas and connect door to door with people, and then you talked about the uh, pipeline company where they um were the opposite of the people that they were trying to connect with. Right, so what I'm hearing is that the people who participated in the action itself had a bigger sense of connection in the Kitimat example than in the, the big rally example. For sure. Okay, awesome, thank you so much. I'm gonna so I'm mute you now and then I'm gonna call on someone else. Um, so another, yeah, and so Eugene made a note that he can't see other people's chats, just my own, so yes, that is definitely not something I was hoping to have happen, but that's how we're going. So speaking of Eugene, Eugene, I already called on you once, but I'm gonna do it again. You said you said rally is lower barrier in a way and less personal. Um, can you say more? Can you say what you more about um, why you said that? Uh, I guess I was. I mean, I was thinking in reference to um, similar to what um, the last speaker said. You know, having that door to door in person conversation. Of, opens up different avenues, whereas at a rally, you're kind of more passive, you're there often just listening. Um, I think there's a lot of other benefits for that in terms of just connecting with people and feeling less, feeling like you're part of a bigger thing, but, um, yeah. uh, and it's just, just in, in terms of lower barrier, maybe the rain was a barrier, but, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it is, uh, it is in a way easier to just kind of show up at something that someone else has organized versus, um, engaging in a personal conversation or, or even going and door knocking, for example, which um, can be, um, you know, harder to get lots of people to do. Totally. Awesome. Thanks, Eugene. Um, and then Keith, you said canvassers may meet non-supporters and influence them. They also had a rewarding outcome. Keith, can you say more about what you mean, like what the canvassers meeting non-supporters and influencing them might mean? Keith, can you talk? Okay, I don't have Keith. I'll mute you. And then, so Kathy, you wrote longer term action focused on goal uh, timeline with Kitimat referendum. Can you say more about what you meant by that, Kathy? You're unmuted. Hi. Um, well, when you went to, I did go to the rally, but it, as you say, it was you going and it's over. Um, it was all inspiring while you were there with like-minded people. But um, mm -hmm. with the Douglas um, Channel group, they they knew what they were working towards. Like they had a goal that they were progressing right. towards, and they they knew when they had achieved it. And so I suppose the pe maybe right. the people who organized the rally would have had those. Um, aspects if they once they had achieved the rally but for the rest of us who attended it was it was a much more passive event absolutely thank you Kathy so what, I, what I'm hearing there is two things one thing is around the sort of focus so I think the the Douglas Channel Watch folks were trying to achieve a very specific thing um, which was like winning the referendum or the plebiscite and the rally was trying to create a buzz but it wasn't there wasn't a specific change that was happening at the end and then also again the engagement with the folks Thank you for that, Kathy. I'm going to mute you now. And then last, um, Nancy, you wrote, both have a role. Um, could, you, could you say more about that, Nancy? Uh, yes, well, I was just sort of building on. Um, uh, in, the, in the rally, I think you've attract, the rally tends to attract like-minded people. People are sort of already interested and engaged in the, in the issue, um, whereas on the doorstep, uh, there's an opportunity to reach out to people um, who may have very different opinions from you, and uh, uh, but it is an opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I think that what was probably quite effective in Kitmat, and I don't know, I wasn't involved, but I think that Enbridge had uh, very little trust of among the, the the residents or many of the residents, whereas. I think a lot of um, Douglas Watch, just Douglas Channel Watch people, probably came across as very uh, credible and sincere, and uh, mm -hmm. that would have 
had a lot of influence on people. That's just my guess, but. Totally. Um, and I, I appreciate you pointing out, um, thank you, Nancy, I'll mute you now. Thank you very much for pointing out that both have a role because that's, that's I'm not trying to say, my, my purpose in contrasting those two examples wasn't to show that one was better than the other in any way. Um, but what I wanted to do was sort of a, to get at the difference between mobilizing and organizing. Um, and that both of these, both of these campaigns, both, both of these examples utilize both to a certain extent, but the Defend Our Coast rally was much more a mobilizing effort, and the, the Douglas Channel Watch example was in many, it was much more an organizing effort. So mobilizing, uh, we can define it as getting individuals to take an action, uh, and organizing is enabling a group of people or people to create change. Uh, and so one way to think about that is that when someone's been mobilized, they're an action taker, and when someone's been organized, they're a leader. And so when I went to the rally, uh, the Defend Our Coast rally, I took an action, but I wasn't in leadership, and there wasn't a very easy or clear path for me to get there. Um, when I, when the people involved in Douglas Channel Watch um, went organized canvassers, they had to become a leader. But even the canvassers were taking leadership because they were getting someone else to take an action. They were mobilizing others. And so all of, uh, all campaigns need to use mobilizing to affect change. So we need, we have resources, we have people power, and we want to use it. We want to mobilize it. But sometimes campaigns only use mobilizing. So they, they don't work to empower leadership in other people um, and expand the amount of leadership on a campaign. Uh, and so when we think about organizing, we're thinking about how can we empower more people so that we can have more power and then we can mobilize more people so that we can have enough power to win those campaigns. And that's really what this engagement organizing framework is about. Uh, and so to unpack a little bit more what we mean about organizing, I wanted to use another case study um, from Colorado called the Campaign for Local Power. And so uh, we were having, uh, on, the, on the theme of technical challenges with the webinar platform, we were trying to get the video to work yesterday and we couldn't get the audio to work. And so I decided to just tell you the story myself. Uh, and we can send around the link to the video, which is very well done afterwards. But so this, takes, this story takes place in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, where they, a group called New Era, had worked to uh, take, take control over their local power utility. So they, a lot of their power came from the regulatory system and local government to take over control, citizen control, of their local power provider so that they could switch to renewable energy. The company, which was named Excel Energy, wound up using a local ballot measure on a municipal election. They wound up putting that ballot measure on to reverse that decision. Um, the, there was a lot of controversy around that process because they sort of used, um, they, made it, they tried to make it look like it was a, a grassroots effort who were opposing this, but it was really run by the company. And there was actually a lot of accusations and evidence of fraud in the, you know, that there were people on the signature, the, the, um, there were signatures on the list who weren't actual residents or that people had been misled into signing. And so they actually took Excel to court to try and um, devalidate the, uh, the, the ballot initiative. And the judge found that, yeah, there was a lot of problems with it, but it wasn't sufficient to take it off the ballot. And so the, the Campaign for Local Power decided to organize. So they did a whole bunch of things. They launched a crowdfunding initiative online, and they got 6,000 people to give them $200,000. They got 500 local people to volunteer to, to go canvassing. So they went door knocking, and they made phone calls to get people to be educated about what this initiative was and what it, their, their vote meant and, the, and to, to make a commitment to vote. They made a hundred thousand. They had a hundred thousand conversations with voters um, in the lead up to the vote. They ran a trick or vote party on Halloween, where they did costumes and then went door knocking, uh, and they made a, a whole bunch of phone calls on election day to get people to the polls. Uh, and then they, you know, had a, a variety of, of media stuff. The result was that they won the campaign two to one. So they had twice as many votes. Um, against Excel's ballot initiative than for it, 
and Excel outspent them two to one. So despite being outspent, they had a, a massive victory on this campaign. Um, and they are now in the pro they are now, this was three years ago that this campaign wrapped up. So they've now, I believe, taken control of their local utility and are in the process of scaling down coal and scaling up um, wind and solar energy for their local community. And so this is like, I think a really exciting local example of, of organizing that also kind of intersects with some of the work um, that West Coast Environmental Law and Defend BC do because there was a legal component to that, uh, to that campaign with a legal challenge. Uh, and so what I want to do is use this example to unpack our definition of organizing. And so um, our, our definition of organizing um, is leadership that enables people to turn the resources they have into the power they need to make the change they want. And the idea is that this definition can be applied to sort of any organizing campaign. And so I want to unpack it a little bit. Um, and so the first thing I want to unpack is the word people and what we mean by that. And so in, there's two ways that we can define the people involved in our campaign. We use the words community and the word constituency. And so a community is a group of people with a shared interest. And a constituency is a community of people who are standing together to realize a common purpose. And so the community in the Campaign for Local Power example is the people of Boulder, Colorado who care about the environment. That's the broad community of people they're working with. People are moved from their community into also being their constituency when they take action. So the people who are part of that constituency are the 500 people who volunteered, are the 6,000 people who gave money. Um, those are the people in the constituency. They're taking action. And the organizer's job is to move people from being in a, from the community, the constituency, and that you want as many people as possible um, from your community to join the constituency and take action. Next, the, we, want, we talk about the resources that we need, um, the, the resources that we have to turn into the power we need to make the change they want. And so some of the resources in the Campaign for Local Power were people's time. Um, they're, they're, they used money. They actually wound up using some of that money to buy TV ads. They, on the, um, as someone noted, I can't remember who it was now, on the, on the Douglas Channel Watch example, one of the resources was actually credibility and relationships. So you have this group of local people wearing Gore-Tex jackets, and then you have this group of people flown in from Calgary wearing actual trench coats, and, and there's this credibility that comes from just knowing what it is to, to, to act like a local in this environment and the relationships that come with it. So those are all, um, those are all resources that you have um, to make change. Um, on, on the piece of power, in organizing, we generally assume that pow a power imbalance is the reason the problem exists. Um, so that we, there's like often, not, we're actually going to dig into this in the strategy portion, but often there's, there's a group of people who have power, so potentially a corporation or a government, and that we need to create enough power to win in the campaign, and we need to shift that power dynamic, and we need to use our resources to do that. Uh, and then finally, the word change, um, it's really important to define the change that we want. And so someone made a, again, someone made a point in the discussion that in the Douglas Channel Watch example, they knew very specifically what they were trying to do. They were trying to win this plebiscite. And, you know, they were also trying to stop Embridge, but they were focusing their resources on a very measurable piece of change. Uh, and that a really solid organizing campaign should have an idea of what they want that change to be um, so that it's measurable and specific, and so they know when they've won, or they know when they've won a piece of their campaign. And we're going to get into the, that idea of creating nested goals towards in the strategy when we get into strategizing. Um, and then finally, I'm kind of looping back and doing leadership at the very end, um, but that leaders are the organizers who are enabling people to make change. And so you're not. Um, you're not doing the work for people. My favorite leadership quote um, goes, and I didn't, I didn't put on the slide, but it goes, um, a leader is best when they are hardly known. At the end of the day, when the work is done and the goal fulfilled, the people we will say, we did it ourselves. And so the idea is not that leadership looks like a, a charismatic figurehead who's winning the campaign, but they're someone who's empowering others to make change. Um, and one way that that looks in practice 
um, is this sort of team structure. And so this is called the snowflake model, which is a, a structure of team, a, a, a team structure model. Um, and it's often the thing that's best known about this organizing framework. And the idea is that here in the middle, we have a core group of people who are the core leadership team. And they're often the people who start the campaign uh, and they are the group of folks who are responsible for strategizing and doing a lot of the big picture work, but that over time they build out multiple, multiple levels of leadership on sort of local leadership teams. And so some campaigns that looks like, uh, you know, there'll be a province-wide campaign and there'll be a core leadership team for the whole province and a local, local leadership team in each community. Or I, I know some people who work on campus divestment campaigns and they have a core leadership team who does planning and then they have a team who are in charge of student outreach and petitioning and they have a team who's in charge of lobbying the university and they have a team who's in charge of creative and direct actions. And so there are different ways of delegating responsibility out so that it's not all one group of people doing all of the work but that you're empowering as many people as possible um, or as many people as necessary rather um, to get the work done that anything you need to accomplish, you can scale your, your leadership level, your number of leaders up to accomplish that through this structure. And then the way that we actually move people through this, um, through that, this, this, this organizer's journey is through the, what we call the five leadership practices. And so we're going to be getting into one of them today, strategizing, but there's a whole holistic framework about how to go about bringing, empowering people to, to join your campaign and make change. And so um, basically we have a, a picture here that actually does quite a good job of explaining what this journey looks like. So in the top corner we have this stick person who sees all these houses and they're upset about it and they're like, oh no, these houses are all broken. We should do something about it. And so they, they find some other people and they tell this story. And the story goes, the houses are broken and if we all got together and pooled our resources, then we could fix the houses. And so once they've told, once they've articulated that story, they can use that story to build relationships with people. So they are now bringing together more and more people who buy into this idea that uh, we should work together to try and fix these houses. Uh, those, a group of those people then work on strategizing. So they get together, maybe there's a flip chart paper with a pointed arrow on top, uh, and they come up with a, a roadmap for how they're gonna do that. Once they have a basic strategy in place, they need to figure out, you know, the, the, the structure. So who's going to be in charge of what? Okay, you're going to be in charge of hammers. You're going to be in charge of radio ads to get people to the building party. I'm going to be in charge of posters, whatever it is. Um, they're going to take different roles to implement that strategy. And then the last thing they do is they pool their resources and they take that action. Uh, and then often at the end of that action, you sort of look and see, okay, what's next? Oh, look, there's some more houses over there. We should fix those too. And so that process is, is sort of a template for how we go through all of, how, how, we, how we organize essentially, um, is we, we tell stories about the challenge. We build relationships with people to, uh, to join our campaign. We structure, the, we structure those teams, those people, we, we structure those people into teams, um, we strategize, and then we take action. And that one way of thinking about this, these leadership practices is that these three, telling stories, building relationships, and structuring teams, is how we actually create and build more power. So we, by using stories and relationships and structure our teams efficiently, we can uh, we can become more effective and become more powerful as a campaigner, as a group of people. And that strategizing and taking action is how we wield power. That's how we actually um, make change. But that too often, I think, people skip these first three steps. They skip the part where they articulate their story or build relationships or structure teams and they just start strategizing or even just start taking action. And that this and that they might have enough power to win, but often they don't. And so these pieces of storytelling and relationships and structure and team structure are often prerequisite pieces to being able to win um, on your campaign. And so that takes us to the end of this. And so what I wanna do is I wanna do two things here. I wanna provide some space for reflection and discussion. Um, 
but we don't have we don't have a group chat, so I'm questioning if this is useful. I think what I'm going to do so I'm going to do two things. If you have a question please, about this, please type it in the question box. Because we're using this box for everything, maybe just per, put the letter Q or the word question at the beginning. But if you don't have a question, I'd love you to take just a couple minutes to reflect on what you learned from this last you know, 20 minutes and what did you already know. And again, if you could put you know, learned or already knew at the beginning before typing it in, that'll just help me understand where you're at and it'll also be a reflective exercise for you. So take a couple minutes um, and type those into the question box, even though they're often statements. Peter, Andrew here. Um, at the risk of interrupting people's flow, I do know that um, Anita has raised her hand a couple of times, and, and it seems, I'm not sure she's using that to try to ask a question, but um, maybe we could just give her a chance at some point. Totally. To, uh, Thank you. Um, so, in, Anita, if you keep your hand up, I'll just unmute you. Anita, do you have something you wanted to add or a question? You can talk now, if you can hear me. Maybe you can't. Maybe she doesn't have a mic. Okay. So Anita, um, I'll mute you right now in case it all of a sudden starts working. But if you have a question, please feel free to type it. Oh, you put your hand down. I, so I, again, put, I put her hand down, actually. <laughs> oh, you put your hand down. Okay. So again, reflecting. So I'll give you another minute, minute and a half, and, and then I'll just answer a couple questions. So um, Gail, you wrote a question about the size of the core group. I might ask you if you can read it out to us. Gail, you're unmuted. Can you, can you ask your question? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Um, so the question was, do you have a recommendation as to the size of a core group? Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, you know, I'm part of several groups and some are quite small, four or five, and some are bigger. Um, I'd like to know from yours or perhaps other people's experience as far as uh, whether, you know, for the small group that I'm part of, do we need, should we be getting more people involved in the right. core? Yeah, so that's, I think that's a tension that I often, that I, I've definitely felt and that I often see other people feeling. Um, so one, one thing that this, um, let me just find the diagram. Um, so on the, on the team structure piece, one of the recommendations of this sort of specific framework around the Snowflake model is this idea of sustainable relationship ratio so that if you want to base your organizing off of close relationships with people, you can only hold so many relationships yourself. Mm -hmm. And that that's often a limiting, that, that that can be a limiting factor in how big you want a specific core or local leadership team to be. Um, and so when we do this training with staff organizers, so let's say someone is organizing using the Snowflake model on an election campaign, we tell a staff person that they can handle at most 10 relationships with other organizers. Um, when they're, you know, they have like a 40 hour work week to work on their campaign. What that, for me, what that says sort of is if you are not a staff, which is I think, you know, a lot of people um, on this call, or you're a staff who isn't spending all of your time as an organizer, that number is often lower. And so that, for me, often leads me to recommend a smaller group of, say, four or five people in a core group, for me, often feels really, really good. That doesn't mean that you don't want more leaders. It's just that those leaders might not all come to this, like, one big sort of core strategizing meetings, or that you might distribute some of your work between two different groups of people. Um, who don't, and not, it's not that those two groups of people never get to talk to each other. It's just that they... Um, that they're, you're maintaining relationships with a sort of sustainable number of people. How does that, how does that sit with you, Gail? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, that works. Um, I, I'm uh, on the board of the Sunshine Coast Conservation Association, and we have a small board, so we actually now have a group of advisors. You know, a lot of people who want to do things in, within your organization don't necessarily want to sit at board meetings. <laughs> so right. that's kind of the way that we're working, and I like the team idea because we're starting to, and I, I said this in another comment uh, more recently, uh, to to you, uh, that we're now working on um, more of a working team um, approach as well. So, because uh, we have so many things on the go, so many irons in the fire, so to speak. So we really almost have to do it that way, you know, develop uh, the, the teams. Mm -hmm. it, it's not that easy. I don't know. Um, uh, that's part of the <laughs> reason why I'm on this, this call too, because um, I'm really interested in exploring that piece, like uh, developing developing really functional teams, say, from the core group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, one of the things you – there's a couple pieces you said there that were useful for me around, um, A, the, the piece on the board, and you wanting to be on a board versus – I think you said something about like wanting to wanting to do something and take, and take action. And I think often there's a tension between governance and action and that um, – some groups, the board becomes the core leadership team, and that works. And sometimes that structure and that sort of like, even you know, using this as like the the implications of that requirement of having a board sometimes doesn't work very well for groups. And that those two things can be different. Um, and then the other piece around just like needing that structure to, to everyone's busy. Um, I think that's really true for me. I, you know, some there's sometimes where I just want someone to give me a bite-sized piece. Um, and I can do that, but I can't be a part of every conversation. And then in some ways, that's an organizer's job. Like I've been a part of campaigns where my only job is making sure everyone knows what they're doing and knows what's going on. I don't actually do any tasks other than making sure people know what's happening. And that's like as much as I can handle in that campaign. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Gail. I'm going to mute you and probably take one other question or comment. Um, which I'm now going to... Find. Um, Eileen, you asked a question, and I'm wondering if I can unmute you and you can ask it verbally. Sure. You can, um, you can hear me? It. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, one of the things I've discovered working with um, over the years is that, you know, we often end up disagreeing on how we should actually organize and do things. And the how, and maybe it's about consensus building, maybe that's a whole different topic, but that seems to be one of the biggest bumps on journey. Totally. And so just to, just to make sure I'm hearing you properly, I'm hearing that it's sort of a, the group, the group isn't on the same page about how to move forward. And so you, you get to this like structure or relationship building portion and you get stalled because people can't agree about what to do next. Yeah, yeah, and, and or how to do it, and you know what what path to take in in the organ. You know, like it uh, seems to me to be an unfortunate aspect of a lot of progressive organizations that they splinter. You know, kind of like the Trotskyites, Leninist kind of whole. You know, splitting up into various groups uh, that dislike each other almost more than the opposition, which I find mm -hmm. very distressing. Mm -hmm. Totally, and so we're we're, we're probably not going to solve that problem in the next hour on the internet. Um, but uh, but I think some some pieces that I I found helpful and seen other organizers um, find helpful is just some basic um, team creation work. So when any time I start a new project, um, there's three pieces that I that I define at the beginning: the team purpose, our team norms, and our roles. Um, interestingly, defining what the team's purpose is can often be a really helpful um, a really helpful point to get all on the same page about what you're trying to do. Um, the team norms are often can kind of, kind of often include a decision making norm so that people are all on the same page about like what'll happen if we disagree. Having that conversation before you actually <clears throat> excuse me, before you actually get into the process of making decisions can be really helpful. Um, and then similarly some of the roles work you can say like so and so is in charge of making decisions in this area. Um, and then we're you know some some of that some of that just division can help resolve some of those tensions, um, but isn't a silver bullet. So I don't, unfortunately, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to, but I don't have a, a, a magic solution for that challenge. Um, although I, I've certainly seen that as well. Thanks um, very much. Thank you. Thanks, Eileen. Um, and I think 
Um, I think we're going to move on. So it's you, it's the, thank you all for your reflections. A bunch of you wrote things that you learned and, and things that you already knew. Uh, I'm not going to read them out or, or, um, or call on you because I want to move on to our next section, um, which is strategizing. This is, this is what's going to take up the rest of our time in this webinar. Um, and I'm just going to get to the slide. Okay, so strategizing. So this is one of the five leadership practices. And um, this was something that we decided to focus on because I think um, the, the, act, the, the process of strategizing, while it's not the first leadership practice, I think is something that is one of the easier things to explain conceptually sort of through a webinar, whereas a lot of the other practices are things that are much easier to teach sort of in a like person-to-person -person workshop. And then also just that um, it's something that applies to folks who are organizing um, or who aren't yet. And so the app, you know, you, you, can, you can strategize and come up with an organizing strategy, or you can, um, you can, you can strategize and come up with some, something different. And so we're all, I think it's, it's, it's useful for folks, and I have run this, this sort of content with folks from the, who do organizing or who do mobilizing or other types of campaigning. And so what we're going to talk about is we're going to look at an, ex an example of strategy. We're going to talk through um, a framework for strategizing called people, problem, goal. We're going to talk about the uh, theory of change. And then we're going to look at um, some frameworks for tactics and timelines for strategizing. And so first, this is just a definition for strategizing. Um, that strategizing is turning what you have into what you need to get what you want, which is a very simple sentence. Uh, and that the thing that you have are your resources, the thing that you need is power, and the thing that you want is change. Uh, and you might notice this is very this is very similar to a portion of the definition of organizing. And so an example of an effective strategy, this is sort of a classic organizing example, um, is the uh, the bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. And so a lot of organizing theory and trainers use this as sort of a, a a really basic starting point for just looking at strategy. Um, and so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, um, but I'll just give you a quick overview of what, of what happened. And so in, in 1956, um, the African American community in Montgomery, Alabama boycotted um, the bus system. And this was all catalyzed out of Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat on the bus to a white man. And so there was this line drawn down um, the, the bus and if you were, um, black you sat on one side and if you were white you sat on the other and if the white person's portion of the bus filled up the black people had to give their seats up. Rosa Parks refused and was arrested and then the boycott started and ran for 381 days. So for 381 days the African American community in Montgomery, Alabama, which was the majority of the bus um, bus ridership client base, just didn't use the bus. Um, and after 381 days the bus system was desegregated. And so that is sort of a, a lot of people have heard of this campaign and there it's it, in retrospect it sounds brilliant but also like yeah that makes sense they they boycotted the bus system um, and then the, the, they they made the bus system change but at the same time there's a lot of there's a lot of strategizing that happened that was going on behind the scenes so they didn't know that they were going, they didn't know um, how long it was going to take. And so they were organizing a, 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 a very big community into a constituency by refusing to use the bus. And so these are folks who, you know, they have jobs, they've got to get to work. Um, they were organizing behind the scenes to, they had a giant, they had a very, a very complex carpooling system to help people get to work. They had um, a program um, behind the scenes to get a bunch of shoes so that people could have good walking shoes to walk, to do all, a whole bunch more walking. Um, they held almost nightly rallies at one of the local churches um, to help keep people focused. And so this was a, an, an enormous and, um, organizing effort. And then also, they, it was a very creative use of their resources. And so the thing that they wanted was um, they wanted to desegregate the bus system. The power that they had was they had economic power over the bus company in the form of their resources, which was their bus fare and the resources they needed to n refrain from riding the bus uh, for, in this case, over a year. Uh, and so 
in retrospect, it's very easy to, to put this into a definition um, and sort of say, oh, this is what they did. But the actual process of making that decision is a very complex one that I think a lot of people grapple with. And so the engagement organizing framework has a, has a, has, has a series of questions to walk us through the process of designing a strategy. Um, and here they are. So the five big questions are, who are our people? What is the problem? What is our goal? What are the tactics? And what is the timeline? And so if we, we can use these questions to walk through the process of designing an organizing campaign strategy. And so with who are my people, often the first question, the, the question um, that people in social change ask, either explicitly or sort of implicitly, is like, what's the issue that I'm working on? And how, um, how can I win it? Um, but in, in, if you're designing an organizing strategy, we actually recommend not doing that. We actually act, recommend asking this question, um, sorry, not what are my people, who are my people, and what is their problem? What is, the pro what is the thing that my people are going to be motivated by? Because if, you, if the power you're going to be building relies on building up uh, people power, if the, that solution requires people power, you need people to really engage by that problem. Uh, and so you need to look at what the problem is that are affecting your people. Um, once you've identified that people and identified the problem, then the, there's often um, some work to f sort of asking about, like, why is that problem the way it is? And so some of the questions that are really useful to ask, uh, why hasn't the problem been solved yet? What would it take to solve the problem? And what type of power are we dealing with? And so we talked about power briefly in the intro. Uh, but we can think of two types of power when we're designing organizing campaigns or any, or any strategy really, um, and it's power with versus power over. And so when in a power with situation, the people that you're organizing have the ability to solve the problem if they just get, get organized. They, the thing they can do is, is within their reach. So an example might be if the problem that they're facing is the lack of um, affordable childcare, they could potentially organize themselves to start a childcare co-op. Um, you know, they could um, they could pull together money or people's time to rent a space and provide childcare, and they could they could start that process. A power over situation would exist if there was some municipal regulation um, preventing a childcare space in that area, or a law preventing a childcare co-op. Then there would be a politician that you had to pressure um, and and force to change those laws. Um, and so often, power over campaigns are ones where you have folks who are um, where the decision maker is in government or a, a large company or corporation who has a decision making power and you need to organize um, and create enough power to force them to to give you what you want and so in the power over situation um, again there's a set there's a series of questions that we can ask that can help us um, make those decisions and so the questions that you can ask are what do we want who has the power to give us what we want? What do they want? And what resources do we have that they need? And so in the case of a politician, that's often something, they, they often want votes, or they want a good media image, or they want money for their campaigns. If they're a company, they want to profit. Um, tied to their profits are their ability to sell their products or um, their brand image. And so there's, by digging into these questions of what we have and what the person with the power making decision or the entity with the power making decision want or need, we can, um, we can shift that power over. Um, and so it's a question of what are our resources and what are the interests of the person or, or body that makes that decision. And so once you've identified the power with power over, um, then there's this question of like, what is the goal? Um, and so as someone noted in the beginning, um, the, the, the goal of the um, Douglas Channel Watch Group was very specific. They wanted, to win the, they wanted to win on that question and say no to Enbridge. In the campaign for local power, they had a very specific goal, which was to take back control of their po local power supply to create renewable energy. And sometimes we can, um, we can just achieve goals in one go, and sometimes we can't. And so that's where this idea of nested goals come in. And so nested goals are really a really useful concept, I find, in articulating um, what, 
you know, small incremental steps that help me achieve my big, my big goal. Um, and so we, you know, we can, you know, think of these little triangles as nested goals towards achieving our mountaintop goal. And so our, um, it, uh, to give an example, so this is an example that actually um, I borrowed from Olivia Chow, who wrote, who, who put this together for a training in Toronto um, around the LGBT community and um, and their goals. And so in this sort of example, this is like a, an example that spans many decades, is the idea of equality regardless of gender and sexuality. So that's sort of this goal. And that within that, there's a whole bunch of things that need to be accomplished. And so if you, if you go back several decades when homosexuality was illegal, if you just decided that we're just going to shoot for straight equality when I can't even um, talk about it without being arrested potentially, um, that you know, you, we need to break that into nested goals. And so these are some of the nested goals that were pursued when you actually look at it historically. Um, so the first goal was to decriminalize um, homosexuality. Then there was campaigns to create um, human rights protection, protection um, from discrimination and protection in the workplace. There was campaigns to reduce police harassment. So despite the fact that it was legal, there was still police harassment on folks because of um, homophobic viewpoints. There was then, you know, the issue for those people became the AIDS crisis and the HIV crisis, and so there was an, a need to address and destigmatize AIDS. There was um, campaigns for relationship recognition. So now that now that we're not being harassed and it's not illegal in this in, or not being harassed in the same way, now there's this need to make it so that um, you know healthcare benefits transfer to partners. And so you can you can go on and on and imagine that over time you could eventually fill in all these triangles, but that by breaking campaigns and issues into smaller pieces and working towards those, we can have more success um, in, achieving, in achieving change because we have been focused. And, and so with your campaigns, um, there might be specific goals, there might be sort of big goals that you're trying to achieve. Uh, and that really thinking like, what is the incremental thing that I can achieve that helps me get closer there is a really helpful piece in, in moving forward. Um, and really focusing your resources. And that also from an organizing perspective can be a very empowering thing for you, people who, who you're trying to get to, to join you in action because they can see progress over time in a way that's harder if you're just shooting straight for your mountaintop goal. Um, a couple of other pieces just to focus on, on criteria for a good goal. A lot of these we've talked about, um, but you should make sure that your goal is measurable, that it focuses your resources, um, that it builds the capacity of your constituency, that it uses a point of leverage and focuses on a motivational issue. And I think we've touched on all of these already, so I'm not going to go any more in depth on that. Okay, so this brings us to the idea of, um, of a theory of change. And so once you've decided on the problem that you're facing and your goal to solve it, the theory of change is a tool you can use to, um, to, to, to articulate your strategy, to articulate how you're actually going to accomplish the thing that you're going to accomplish. Um, and the theory of change can be expressed in a theory of change statement. And so this is just a, a written tool to write out what it is you're going to do. Um, and we can write it out in an if-then because statement. So if we, do, um, if we do our strategy, then we'll achieve our goal because of some reason um, and so what the purpose of this is to write out your, how your strategy is going to lead to your goal, and then the because portion is the thing, is sort of unpacks the assumptions. And so to give sort of like a childishly simple example, if the problem I'm facing is that I get really hungry at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the solution might be that I should eat lunch at noon. So the theory of change for that would be if I eat lunch now, then I won't be hungry later because my body will digest it and produce energy. Um, and so there's this thing I'm going to do. It's there. I'm going to eat lunch. The result is that I won't be hungry. And the because is this logical tie-in that explains why what I'm going to do is going to lead to the goal that I want, why my strategy is going to result in the, the change I want to see. Um, and in this case, it's because digestion works. That's the example, which is, which is, which is very obvious. Um, but this can be really useful. So we'll, we'll, let me just go through a few examples quickly. So if we get 60% of the community to sign a petition opposing the mind development, 
then the mine will be rejected because there will be a severe political backlash if the community is overruled. If we raise awareness of the dangers of climate change, then we will avoid runaway global warming because people will make lifestyle changes to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. If I chain myself to the front of the UVic library, then UVic will divest from fossil fuels because the university will know I'm serious about divestment. If I yell loud enough, then people will do what I'm yelling at them to do because yelling is an effective means of persuasion. And then finally, this was a video clip I was hoping to show you, but this is, this is, a, a, clip, this is a, a, a South Park episode where there's these underpants gnomes and they're stealing underpants. And this is them explaining their strategy. So phase one is you collect underpants, phase two, and then phase three, profit. Um, and so when you actually write out your theory of change in a sentence, it can help expose absurd theories of change or theories of change that just aren't going to work. So if you had 60% of a community who signed a petition opposing the mind, you might win. Uh, it might depend on the political influence of that community, how big it is, who their MP and MLA are, how organized they are. I think we have tried raising awareness on climate change as a way to solve it. Um, I think that was Al Gore's theory of change for, for a number of years. And, and I think I would argue that that hasn't worked out for us. Uh, I don't think that me chaining myself to the library will get a university to do something, and yelling is not an effective means of persuasion. Um, and so the idea is that if you write out your theory of change statement, it's going to really show if the thing you think you're going to do is actually going to work, and that the because portion of your statement should really make sense. And so some of the best theories of change statements that I've seen, the because portion says things like, because corporations are only interested in profit or because First Nations legal challenges have enough constitutional power to change, um, to, to force governments to make changes. You know, so the because portion relies on an assumption that really holds true, um, as opposed to, you know, something like, um, if people know about an, an issue, then they'll take action because, because they care, which would be great if it was true, but often isn't. And so, there's a whole bunch of different types of theories of change um, and different strategies. There's things like education um, and raising awareness. There's, you can use technology or marketing or lobbying in organizing. There's a bunch of different ways, theories of change around organizing. You can organize around elections. You can organize consumer boycotts. You can organize around civil disobedience and direct action. And so there's lots of different ways of strategies that you can apply this theory of change um, statement idea to. Um, and then, on, because we're on this uh, West Coast Environmental Law um, webinar, I wanted to just quickly touch on theories of change in the law. Um, and, and so this is just like, this was just sort of me thinking about it. This isn't part of the, the engagement organizing framework, but for me, I really thought of two ways that, that law could engage with strategy and theory of change. One is that you could have a legal theory of change where your strategy is actually tied to the, a legal options, like a court process. And then there's also using legal opinions to strategize. Um, and I asked, I asked a couple of people if they would be prepared to share with me. And so um, Gwen, I'm wondering if you are, are still feeling okay about um, talking about some of these examples from, from your perspective. Can you hear me, Gwen? Gwen? No, maybe Gwen. Oh, are you there, Gwen? Going to try one more time. Nope. Okay. Gwen, oh. if you don't have a mic, um, can I ask uh, you to try phoning in on the telephone and entering the PIN number, and then Peter can unmute you from there. But in the meantime, maybe you want to move on to Doug, Peter. Yeah, totally. I can. Okay. Um, Doug, can you can you speak? Doug. Yeah, not working. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, good. good. Awesome. So, um, so everyone, I asked Doug if he would be willing to share um, some of his ex some of his experiences with these two things. So, Doug, maybe could you just in a minute or less explain um, who you are, where you're from, and what campaign you're working on? Yeah, I'm uh, Salmon River and Hatchman in, in Langley. We formed in uh, about 1995. Mostly about water issues at that time, and that's still a big issue. Uh, 
So the Salmon River is a, quite a productive coho stream. It's not very big, but it comes out of both Fort Langley. And the issues with water quality and quantity. And what is your organization trying to achieve? Well, we've uh, been trying to get uh, not just more awareness of the water issues, uh, mm -hmm. but also trying to lobby. Of course, we're stuck with lobbying the provincial government for most of this to actually get a proper groundwater act in place. Mm, okay. It's been very slow progress. Um, and in trying to achieve that, have you used have you used like a, have you used a legal theory of change at all in that process? Well, we worked with with West Coast uh, a couple of times with Linda Nolan both times uh, to uh, about ten or twelve years ago. She gave us an opinion on what we could do in terms of strategy to try and protect the groundwater here. Okay. The stream, of and course, so, is suited on the groundwater. And so what I'm hearing there is that you, you use legal advice to shape your strategy? Yeah, we did it with the EDRF uh, funding, and she spent some time and talked with the municipal people and, uh, and uh, came up with uh, some ideas. We've continued to work together since then on one of those issues, actually. Okay. Um, and was there, a specific, was there a specific strategy that came out of those discussions? Well, we were able to kind of, there was already a process going on in Langley to uh, um, address the water issues. In fact, there was even a moratorium on development here at that time for a big part of the watershed. So we were able to keep that moratorium in place for a few more years, okay. partly through that. Um, and we were able to encourage the township to hire some staff to develop uh, some ground, we developed some uh, staff here that could lobby the province to try and get more groundwater legislation in place. So we're able to, to work with the municipality on that uh, on that issue, which uh, of course is still an ongoing issue for the province. It's been very slow to uh, bring anything actually effective in, but we've made some progress. And what do you think it would? What do you think the strategizing process would have been like if you didn't have that legal advice? Um, I think it helped. A lot of these things are, are I think, just trying to uh, establish yourself as a credible player at the table. Mm. And I think having West Coast involved, having Linda uh, contact the township and, uh, and uh, provide us with uh, a strategy, it, it helped with our membership. Uh, they were able to see a, mm. that something was being done and it helped with our credibility with the township. To, to help us advocate for some change. Right, and so what I'm hearing there is both in terms that the, the legal opinion and, 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 and aid was used not just to strategize, but also it was used as a resource. So it helps it increase your credibility and it made both with the town and with your people. So your people felt sort of increased confidence because there was a lawyer involved. Yeah, yeah, very much so. and, and uh, uh, because it was Linda, of course, we've continued to work because she's still active on those issues. So it's helped to form a, a network that we've been able to work with. Um, and we've worked with the, the uh, well drillers and people like that as well. So there's a bunch of groups involved in that. And, and having that uh, help encourage them to, to consider us as a, you know, a voice that needed to be heard, so to speak. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Doug. I appreciate I appreciate You're you welcome. sharing. You're welcome. All right. I'm going to mute Doug, and I'm going to try Gwen one more time. Um, Gwen, can you hear me? Apparently, if Gwen can hear me, they cannot speak. Okay. Um, thank you very much again for that, Doug. I appreciate it. And so, uh, what I wanted do now is I was hoping to give everyone a chance to just like play with this. Oh, when you wrote, it says I am unmuted. I'm not sure when you wrote that. Okay, I'm going to move on anyways. You said that when you oh. muted her. Um, so I don't know, but like when we're still not able to hear you with it, it seems. Right. Okay, that's okay. We're, we'll, we'll, we'll move on. I was just noticing that in the... Um, There's a note from... Uh, Laurel offering to talk about the theory of change uh, using the legal opinion they received. Cool. Actually, yeah, that'd be great. Why don't we do that really quick? Um, I'll find Laurel. Laurel, you are unmuted. Can you hear me? 
I can hear you. Oh, great. Um, so we actually also used the um, West Coast Law Fund, and we got a lawyer to do a legal opinion piece for us. And what that ended up doing, on the one hand, it helped us kind of switch strategies um, because we were we had accomplished a number of goals for the Divest Victoria movement, which is asking the municipal government to divest from fossil fuels. Uh, but we were at a kind of crossroads after getting our municipal government mostly on board about where we were going to go from there. And so the legal opinion kind of outlined a number of our legal options. Um, and one of those was to go to the Municipal Finance Authority, um, which is an amalgamation of a bunch of municipalities. And so that legal opinion, um, we then forwarded it to the Tofino municipality as well as the new Westminster one. And they actually, um, Victoria and Tofino used that legal opinion to draft a motion to the Coastal Community Collective. It's a AVICC meeting that's coming up. Um, and they're planning on putting a more motion forward to the UBCM, which is the Union of BC Municipalities. Um, so on the one hand, it's helping us kind of direct where our next steps are going, but then it's also um, kind of going up through the political channels and directing different councillors who are on board with our movement. Right, and so um, what I'm hearing there, Laurel, is that you, um, you use the legal advice to sort of um, pick the pick the, the your area of focus, and that that also provided you with um, a, some information and tools to sort of channel that to various decision makers within various levels of government. Is that right? Precisely. Um, and what would have happened if you didn't have that advice? You know, we had been um, getting together as a group and kind of discussing what our next steps were, and there was a really diverse opinions on where we should go and right. really most people were at a loss and we actually started losing volunteers because our meetings stopped being right. as productive as they were wow. before because we didn't actually have that focus and having so many people involved in this kind of strategic decision making I think was exhausting for a lot of people. Right, interesting, that's really helpful and I think one of the, one of the things that that makes me think is just going back to the question we had earlier about internal disagreement um, that not, not that I think this is like necessary or always appropriate, but it sounds like in this case, that was really, the legal advice was really helped you get over that hurdle. of it Absolutely. Oh, interesting. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Laurel. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks. Um, okay. Um, neat. I've never, I've never discussed that with anyone before. That was a really neat exercise for me. I hope everyone else got some, got some thinking out of that. Uh, so what I want to do now is I want to take a few minutes, and again, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing this format where I'm asking you to um, to do some work um, and to to write out some some work in in these question boxes. And the reason that I want to do that is just because I think it's a much more helpful and cements learning much better if people actually use use the material rather than just hear someone talk about it. So what I want you to do is I want you to try and write out a theory of change statement for one of the campaigns that we've heard about so far, or your own if you want. Um, so we've we heard about the campaign for local power, we heard about Douglas Channel Watch, we heard about the Montgomery bus boycott, um, or you could use your own. And what I'd love to encourage you to do is just take a few minutes and, and type in the question box an if-then-because statement for, for one of those campaigns or for your own, just like trying to go through that process of, of seeing what it's like to try and articulate a strategy in that way. Um, and so I'm just going to, again, I'm just going to pause and let you do some of that work, um, type it into the question box, and, and see how it goes. Peter, just a heads up that, that we're running a little low on time in terms of getting into questions and answers, so keep an eye on the, uh, I think we yeah. asked people to wrap up by 1.30, I think, originally, and we're just coming up to that. Oh. I I've had no. us to I had us at two. Oh, I have, in all of the discussions we've had. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I forgot. I've misremembered. Um, Bar is Barb? Does Barb know Barb doesn't have audio? Maybe let's. I'm here. Yes. Um, I thought it was two, but um, oh, uh, sorry, my mistake. My mistake. Sorry. Okay. I know that some people have left left uh, already, but but um, obviously I mixed up on the end time. Sorry. Okay. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um, for, for, for keeping me on time even more rigidly than, than we needed to. 
I appreciate it. So everyone take a couple minutes um, and, and just try and try and go through that process. And I'm gonna I'm gonna mute myself if if you and if you have questions you want to ask in that space, just do that, but write the word Q, word question or the letter Q first. And so if you're struggling, sometimes the most helpful thing for me is to start with the goal. So I'll write if blank, then the thing I'm trying to achieve. So then I'll win the plebiscite or get control of local power. And then you can write the strategy for how you might get there. It can be useful sometimes. And I'm going to give you two more minutes if you're getting to a point in a minute where you're like have something kind of half formed I'd love for you to just put it in and I might call on someone to share So we're going to do this for one more minute just so you know people are typing in their theory of change statements and it's very exciting. Um, and also there's a dog right next to me right now, just side note. Okay, I'm going to wrap up in 20 seconds and I'm going to, I might call in a couple people to read theirs out and then we might talk about them. So just be prepared for that if you typed one of yours in. It's the, the prize for participating fully. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring us back, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask some people to to share a couple of these. So um, I'm gonna ask Mar to speak first. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Mar Martinez. Um, can you can you speak? Can you if you can you try talking? Nope, I'm not hearing you. Oh, you can't you can't speak. Okay. 
Um, I will ask then. Um, I'm gonna ask Lorene to to share. Lorene, can you can you try talking? Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Oh, I can. Can you can you read out your theory of change statement? Oh, sure. I said if we go out into the community and meet with people, then we can build awareness of our organization and develop connections because we are building relationships. Totally. Um, does does the uh, and so for me, I think that um, the that feels really true. Like if you do those things, like you, if you meet with people, you'll build awareness and develop connections because of relationships. I'm curious if awareness of your organization is the end goal, is like your goal, or if that's a way to get there. Uh, what, the, first, the first step, it's a continuum. So I think the challenge is whatever organizations I've been involved with, sometimes it gets frustrating because we sit there going, but we, we have these meetings and no one shows up. Right. <laughs> We've got these great campaigns and no one knows about them or no one knows about our organization, the good work we do. So, right. um, and it's not because we're not working hard or developing materials, it's just that whole thing of um, there are people that have common interests and would support us and maybe would get involved but they're out there, they're busy, they don't know about the meetings or they're too busy, they don't come to meetings. So my big thing is, let's go out there and where are they? So maybe there's a festival and we have a table out there and we start talking to them and they go, oh, I think the same way, I didn't know about you. Um, right. And then as you start talking to people too, instead of just being um, a name, then they go, oh, I, you know, I, I talked to this, this, this great fellow and, or this woman and I'm really, yeah, I was really amazed. We just hit it off and I'm really interested. And then they talk to their neighbors or friends and then somebody wants to then go meet with, go to a yeah. meeting, go to an event. So it builds, so it's a continuum. And then as they get to know, and maybe it's one specific point, where it's one event they're interested in or, or one issue, but it also might be just, oh, they're interested in the organization. And then as they get to know the organization, then they want to participate more or they want to donate or whatever. But that's, to me, it's a continuum. You start on that path of getting to know each other and then building. Totally. And so I think what I'm hearing there is that maybe that's like a theory of change statement for like how relationship building builds value for your campaign. Yes. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, I'm gonna call. I'm gonna call on Eugene. Eugene, I hope you don't feel like I'm picking on you too often. I've asked you to do this a couple times, but I liked what you wrote. Um, could you share? Uh, sure. Let me see if I can find my quote here. Oh, here it is. Uh, if we add to the cost and delay of a pipeline, then the company will not invest because they care about money. Awesome. And so. Uh, the, well, maybe I'll just tell you what I, I liked about it and you can see if there's anything you want to add. So what, the thing that I think I like the most is that companies caring about money feels really true and like really like simple and, and it, it feels like I feel really comfortable grounding a campaign in, in that because that feels like a really, a really solid uh, premise. Um, where, what, what, did, you, did you come up with that on your own? Is that from a campaign you've worked on? Like where did that statement come from for you? Um, I mean, it's a... I think it's a part of a um, larger campaign that, that, that I'm working on that I've been studying and looking at. Um, to me, what is interesting about it is um, with a lot of our groups, you know, um, I think it's interesting to think about uh, the question of power that you raised earlier and how that plays into the stories that we're telling and the audiences that we're targeting. And for a lot of us, um, for example, the reason that we're doing this work may be different from the motivation of the actors uh, whom we're trying, whose behavior we're trying to change. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think uh, heavy oil pipelines, and particular Kinder Morgan pipeline, uh, is one that I'm working on a lot, um, is an example of that um, where. You know, we talk a lot here when we're talking to about building um, movements and resistance and opposition locally about things like oil spills and the beauty of Bard Inlet and the Salish Sea and, you know, the health of salmon. And those are all super important things. I, I don't want to diminish that as, as 
our own um, uh, motivations and of, of those of our supporters, and they're important. Uh, but I did, you know, I was I had the opportunity to travel down to Houston last year for Kinder Morgan's annual general meeting. When I was there, I did a toxic tour of the chip channel there, and I realized there that you know basically they'd created a massive industrial sacrifice zone, mm -hmm. and that if they were going to do that in their backyard, that these messages of um, preservation of natural habitat and so on were not going to go very far. But what did resonate and what did they did pay attention to was cost, delay, uncertainty, all the yeah. things that our collective uh, resistance represents to them in a way that matters to them. And I think that was my that was my main takeaway. Totally. And so I think one of the things I'm hearing there is like this need to channel those values of like this beautiful coast that motivate us, but channel it into a form of power that works for the target we're, we're, we're looking at. And so not trusting the government or corporation to be altruistic, but really asking like, what do they value and what do we have? How can we channel those values into something that they actually care about? Yeah, yeah. And I think, and again, in my view, it's a multi-faceted uh, mm -hmm. approach. Totally, awesome. Thank you so much for that, Eugene. I really appreciate it. No worries. All right, let me meet you. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna move us on to the last little piece of content so we can have a, a few minutes for questions. So thank you for doing that exercise. Um, I gave you five minutes or less to work to write out a theory of change statement. Um, this isn't something, this is often something that takes a long time. I was actually working on this in a, a different sort of workshop for myself this morning before I came on this call. Um, and it's something that can take a long time. I think it's really valuable to write all this out. Um, and I think that it can often make, force an organization's leadership team to all get on the same page um, and avoid some of that internal, and it can even be a tool to help um, it resolve some of that internal disagreement when we actually all write this out um, together. So um, the last two things we're going to talk about are tactics and timeline. And so once you have your goal and you have your strategy, then you can select tactics. And so one way that I like to think about tactics um, is actually using this picture. So if we think of ourselves as this smiley face person in the top left, and we think of the chain we're, change we're trying to achieve as this yellow X, um, then the strategy is how is the path we're going to take to get there. So we could go through the mountains, we could go down the river, or we could go through the desert. Um, and so let's say, for example, we decide that our strategy is to take the river. Then our tactic could be to swim, to build a raft, to take a kayak. Um, we could t and so our tactic in this case is to use a boat. So our strategy is to take the river, our tactic is to use a boat. If we decided on our tactic before we decided on our strategy, so let's say we decided to use a boat, but then realized that the best thing, the best path is to go through the mountains, then the boat is going to be a hindrance or completely useless. Uh, the, if we decided that we're going to ride a scorpion uh, and then uh, go through the river, then the scorpion would drown and might take us with it. And that would be really a really bad idea. And so this is just a, a way of illustrating that if you lead with tactics, if you pick tactics before you define your strategic approach, um, it can be, it can, your tactic could do nothing, it could be counterproductive, um, and then it's also, um, it could, sorry, I lost my train of thought, it could be counterproductive, uh, and it's also possible that it could, it could work, and so sometimes if you just pick a tactic, it might be really effective, but that doing that groundwork of strategizing before picking a tactic is really, really useful. And so when we're picking tactics, we have this sweet tactic framework that helps us pick really sweet tactics that help us achieve our goals. And so in organizing, um, a sweet tactic is one that helps us achieve our theory of change. So um, in Eugene's example, where if we delay a pipeline, then it'll be, if we, if we cause delays, then the pipeline will be stopped because they care about money, um, a, the, a tactic that promoted that theory of change would be one that increased the cost of that pipeline or created delays. Um, if it, it develops leaders, if the people involved in the tactics develop more leadership capability uh, as they, they go through it, and then it strengthens your organization uh, in some way by adding resources. So we keep talking about resources that lead to power, and so strengthening your organization could be adding people, it could be adding money, it could be creating reputational capital so that governments are afraid of you. Um, 
that could be doing all sorts of things. Uh, and so a sweet tactic is one that applies to all, that fits all three of these criteria. And then finally, it is a really good idea, I think, to, uh, to, to have a timeline in mind for your, for your campaign. Uh, and so there's um, a few different courses of a timeline. There's, um, we have a, a foundation period where we're doing a lot of that relationship building work where we're not actually doing any tactics yet. So before we launch our, we do our first action, we're building, we're telling, we're articulating our story, we're building relationships, we're structuring our leadership team, and we're strategizing. Uh, and then we're, we're just, we're doing relational tactics. Uh, and then we have a kickoff and we have, might have a few different campaign peaks before we achieve our strategic goal. Uh, and that along the way, it's important to remember to keep doing those power building um, practices so we continue to articulate our story and build relationships and add people to our team structure and, and reevaluate how that structure is going. Um, and that, but that each, each campaign peak, each tactic, campaign tactic you're implementing is a peak in capacity um, that eventually gets you to your goal. And then after that, it's um, a really critical step to evaluate and celebrate before you do the next thing. Um, and so that's all the content I was going to go through. Uh, I want to do two, uh, do two things again. I want to provide, again, space for people to just provide some reflection uh, for this whole thing. Um, what did you learn and what did you already know? Uh, and and also to just ask questions. So again, using the question box, if you have a question, put a cue or a, the word question at the beginning. Um, and and if you have, and also also please, uh, I encourage you to to use the question box to just type in some things that you learned and some things that you that you already knew, um, and just take a couple minutes to do that. And then if you have, if there's a question, then I can answer those for a bit. Uh, just a reminder, um, and, and Peter, correct me if you don't want them to do this, but it seems to me that this would be a good time for people to raise their hands if they do have a question they want to ask rather than... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. If, you, if you would rather um, raise your hand than type it, that's totally fine. Um, but also if you want to type it, if that's helpful for you in articulating it, you can do that too. People are starting to write things, so thank you for doing that. So I actually think I'm gonna I'm gonna read some of these out because I think it's um, there's some there's some nice insights here. So uh, so Sierra wrote great reminder that strategizing is important and so is goal setting. I find the theory of change helpful for my next step. Thank you. Uh, Gwen Gwen wrote the importance of not assuming campaign strategies will work because you have always done them. I really like and appreciate that a lot, Gwen. I think that uh, sometimes we do things over and over and so they feel like a really good idea. Uh, and sometimes we've done things and they've worked before, but they're not actually gonna work in our new context. And so I think that's a really, I really appreciate that, um, that insight. Kathy wrote, uh, learn that there can be a series of sub goals that lead to the overall goal. I think that's where I've been getting stuck. Uh, that's great to hear, Kathy. Um, the, the idea of nested goals was really helpful for me um, in breaking down things into bite-sized pieces. And I've seen in my organizing uh, that people have, 
it's, it's very motivational for people to be able to focus on something, see it get done, and then move on to the next piece. Keith wrote, I learned language for concepts I already implement, helpful for teaching others. Absolutely, I think a lot of this stuff is probably, you know, is probably stuff that a lot of you have learned from your organizing or even from other parts of your lives. Uh, and that for me, when I first learned this framework, a lot of it was articulating things that I already did, but it helped me teach it to others, absolutely. Laurel wrote, in this second half, the majority of it is pretty new to me. Love struggling through the theory of change exercise and the distinction between strategy and tactics was valuable. Now I'm going to maybe read like one or two more. Uh, oh, can I get that? Yeah. Um, Mar wrote, I think it is important to include adaptability. Uh, all strategies and tactics need to be reviewed often because of the complexity of many situations. Absolutely. Um, one thing I actually didn't say, which I'm shocked at myself now that I didn't say it, is that um, strategizing is something you do, not something that you have. And so you can create a strategy, but that um, the reason we call it a theory of change is that it's a theory that you test, and you test it by putting it into action, and that you need to re you should really revisit your strategy over and over again, and ideally work into your strategy, um, uh, ideally re re review your strategy ongoing and build into your strategy ways to test it. So thank you very much for that re um, reflection. Um, Gail, I see you have your hand up. Gail, do you, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Uh, so at the beginning, you said something to the effect of five leadership traits we're going to learn. Um, can you just review what those five are? Because I've been, I've been writing down some notes, and I'm not sure. Were those totally. like five big questions, or, or what were? Yeah, what totally. Were they? So, so, and this, like, I maybe didn't do a good enough job of explaining how that re those five leadership practices related to our content. So. Five leadership practice I'm talking, I was talking about at the beginning was the, the storytelling, relationship building, strategizing, structuring leadership, and taking action. Um, we didn't get into all of those. So mo for the most part, I gave a brief overview of how those can work. Um, and then we just talked about strategizing. Uh, Organized BC does two-day workshops that unpack all of these practices. Um, and that, I'm actually going to plug how you can potentially access those um, in just a minute. Um, and so we didn't we didn't unpack all of those. The that was the sort of the that was the most in depth you got on all but um, on the strategy piece. Does that does that make more sense now? Oh uh, yeah, it does. And that kind of leads into the second part of my question, and mm -hmm. which is: Is there uh, any links that you can give us uh, for more information about uh, about this? Mm -hmm. um, so about what I can. What I can do, so I was I was wanting already to potentially send an email up to everyone with the link to the video I didn't get to show you, and oh. maybe what I'll do is I'll include um, with that a link to the the handbook we use in our trainings. And so I don't want to say that the handbook is a is a replacement for attending a training, but it could be helpful. And so um, we we give them out in trainings. They look like this, um, and it's it's a document that kind of unpacks all of this in in much more depth. And so I'll make sure that we send that around with um, with that. And, and Andrew here, I, I just think I should say that when we when we first approached Peter, you know, we were all clear that we're not going to be able to deliver a yeah. full uh, organizing workshop in two, two hours. Um, and hopefully that was clear in the materials as well. It was intended to provide a bit of an overview so that um, uh, you can be aware of some of the pieces that you may need to think about incorporating into your campaigns. But uh, clearly, Further, further research, learning, attending workshops is, is all uh, for the good. If if people are are trying to incorporate these into their their actual campaigns, totally. And so I might actually just uh, give a quick pl plug for how we can do that before we go into a, 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 any more questions. So um, if you're interested in contacting me, my email's here. It's Peter at organizedbc.ca, um, and that our website organizedbc.ca. Uh, is a place where you can find information about upcoming trainings. Um, we put them on generally a month to two months in advance, so it is it is worth checking back um, about for them. And right now we have one scheduled for Victoria in May, uh, and that sh I believe is on the website or should be really soon. And then we're tentatively running the, our next training in Vancouver uh, in June. Uh, and so we'll, we 
we run trainings in sort of the larger population centers more often than in more rural places, but we run trainings in the north and in the Okanagan, um, as well as, as on sort of the, the coastal urban centers um, of Vancouver and Victoria. And so, yeah, those are places where you can get more in-person training from us if that's a thing that you're excited about. Another opportunity to, uh, where there'll be some of these skills offered as well as other, um, training from other frameworks um, is we're, we're, we're organizing a conference in Vancouver called CanRoots, and so it's a, it's a gathering of progressive organizers from BC and across the country where there'll be workshops on the Snowflake model, on storytelling, as well as on digital skills um, and case studies from uh, exciting campaigns from across the country and including around the world. And so you can go to canroots.ca um, and you can register for that there if you want. Um, there's, there's prices for um, organizations and there's, there's like low cost prices for students. So if you um, are interested in this and in, in sort of learning more, that's also a really, really good opportunity to do that. Um, any, any other questions people want to ask? Either um, you can put your hand up if that's helpful or you can type them in the, the question box. And if not, I'm going to count to seven in my head, and I'll do one last thing before we close out. Okay. So if you're looking for something to address, Keith had uh, expressed frustration with the theory of change. I don't know if that's worth unpacking at all. Oh, yeah. Um, back at 143 on the questions. I get frustrated with theories of change. We persuade government that it would be wrong to do that versus making the government realize they would pay a penalty in some way if they do that. Keith, so. Cool. Keith, did you want to say more about that? Keith? Nope. Okay. All right, I'm going to do one other closing activity, which, and then I think we'll probably end maybe two minutes early, which will be nice, um, is I just want, oh, Keith, Keith has no mic. Sorry, Keith. Um, I just want, I was hoping for everyone to give just some ref, some some reflections. So a rose and a thorn, if this is a new concept to you, uh, a rose is just something that you really enjoyed or really got, really got a lot out of. Um, and that could be a piece of content, or it could be a way that this webinar was run. Um, and a thorn is something that you didn't like or something that didn't work for you. So it could be, um, again, and the, the content that we chose, how it was presented, it could be, about, the Rose of the Thorn could be about technology, anything like that. But just, um, again, typing into the question box, I'm sorry you can't see each other's answers, but it's really helpful for me to see them and I'll, I might read a few out. So um, yeah, type those in there and that'll help us, help us just reflect and close on this whole webinar. And thank you all for your participation and typing. I appreciate it a lot. It's helpful for me to interact with people and not just talk into a thing. I have a rose from Laureen. Rose, like participating in writing out the statement. I'm glad that went well. Mar says, excellent overview, Rose. Laureen says, a thorn, not being able to have group chat to see others' comments. Yes, I'm sorry that I didn't, we didn't realize that that was a limitation before we started. Keith says, Rose, connecting with others, especially from our far-flung rural community. Awesome. Gail says, a rose was the level of interaction. And now I'm out of things to read out to you. Oh, Laurel, Rose, uh, loved how you synthesized participants' comments after they spoke, demonstrating that you heard, but also helped me focus on the core of what they were saying. I'm glad that worked, Laurel. Kathy says, thanks for a useful presentation. Lots of things for me to think about as I reorganize my thoughts. Too bad everyone didn't have a mic. Uh, Barb says, total thorn that GoToWebinar does not have a group chat. Um, yeah, that's too bad. Um, let me go back to that box. Laurel has a thorn. My internet connection cutting out. Oh, no. Sorry to hear that. Uh, Ken, good stuff. A rose struggled with technology, i.e. lost question box for most of session. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Ken. Um, and I might just wait to see if a couple more people have any. Sierra, Rose, love presentation, lots of info, Thorn, fine two hours, a little long. 
can't sit this long. That's fair, Sierra. I have I have a convertible standing desk, so that's how, how I've been managing it, but that is not something most people will have. Um, and I might just wait another 30 seconds to see if any other comes. Um, any other thoughts, folks? Nope. All right. Um, that's, that's, I think that's all I have. Let me see if I have any other slides. Yeah, I think, I think we, I think everyone got their questions out. Oh, everyone's just starting. Thank you. You're welcome, everyone. Um, uh, Andrew or Barb, any closing comments from you folks? Just uh, these final minutes. I appreciate, uh, Peter, the, uh, your, your work on this and, and your, your use of an interactive, uh, setting and yeah clearly we could have tested the the technology and realized that that was a problem earlier um but uh, thank you very much for doing it and thank you everyone for attending um i think that, that the the recording of this webinar will be a useful resource to make available to future edrf uh grant recipients and other people who are working with as well awesome well thanks everyone um and yes sierra's asking our slides available. We, I, I will include. I will work with Barb and Andrew to figure out how we will get this to you. But I will include a PDF of the slides, a link to the video about the campaign political power, and a PDF of our organizing handbook. Um, so we'll get that out there. Awesome. Um, thanks, everyone. Appreciate your being here. Feel free if you have any specific questions and you want to hang out and chat. I can do that. But otherwise, um, thanks so much for being here.